everyone, and welcome to the Water Online Show, Business of Water. We have a special guest here planned for you today. Uh, I know that with Water Online specifically, uh, we talk a lot about, uh, obviously, things that are water, wastewater specific. But today we're going to go into a little bit more of a broader range from a, a subject matter standpoint. So uh, whether we're talking about multiple industries regarding, say, green energy or refineries or oil and gas, uh, the interesting thing about those industries is that they share similar struggles and similar um, solutions related specifically to flow measurement. Uh, so today I kind of wanted to get into, and, and also not just flow measurement, but measurement and calibration too. So all of those things are almost universal when we talk about those different markets. So we'd like to welcome to the show today, none other than Adam Schlehan. He is the Director of Sales and Marketing for FCI. Adam, thank you very much for joining us and helping uh, shed some light on some of these some of the subject matter uh, for our audience today. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So I wrote down some notes here before we we uh, got on air here, and I wanted to just start at the very top. Um, okay. And I mentioned in in the introduction that um, that we're going to be talking about multiple industries here, not just focused on water, but sort of branching out into oil and gas, refineries, green energy, things like that. So. Uh, in the process industries, as I like to call them, yeah, you have your chemical plants, refineries, water treatment even can be included in there. Um, the thermal mass flow measurement technology is perhaps a bit more of a, say, unique technology uh, compared sure. to something that you hear about every day, such as differential pressure. Uh, so what is thermal and how, okay. might, how might it be different than something like differential pressure or, say, an orifice plate? That's a, that's a great question. And the, the, the first thing that I'll say is each instrument technology, each, each one you pick, whether it's a, a differential pressure, an ultrasonic, a Coriolis, a, a thermal, each one has its pros and cons. And not every instrument is going to fit well in every application. Um, my, my first piece of advice is to talk to an expert and, and do your own homework. There are, there are certain applications that, that each instrument works very, very well in. For thermal in particular, um, what I'd say is that the way a, a thermal mass flow meter, or in some cases a, a thermal switch works, is, is heat loss. So mm -hmm. uh, you think about a process media, you think about gas flowing, each molecule in that gas has a, a cooling effect, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and with a, a thermal mass flow meter, what you have, you have, you have two thermal wells, and within each thermal well is a PT 1000 ohm RTD. And this is measuring the, the temperature of that gas flow. Now there's one uh, heated RTD, and then there's one reference RTD that's passively measuring the temperature of that gas flow. At all times, there is a delta T, a, a difference in temperature between our active and heated RTD yep. and our reference RTD. And again, going back to the, the gas media or the, the media that's flowing by, each molecule has its own unique cooling effect. So the, the higher the density, the more molecules you have coming into contact, the more heat loss, and the higher velocity, the, the more heat loss. Um, one thing I would say about thermal in general is that it is a direct mass flow measurement, meaning that you don't need a pressure instrument or a temperature instrument to, to compensate for any of the, the density changes in order to get a mass flow measurement. Um, the other thing I'd say about, about mass flow, uh, thermal mass flow in general, is that you don't have any moving parts to, to clog or foul or cause a big, a big pressure drop. Um, works great in, dust, in dusty applications and works very well in low flows and also high flows. So the, the turn down, which I think we'll, we might be talking about that a little bit later. I do have that um, written down to come back to. Yeah, go typically, ahead. A, typically a, a 100 to 1 all the way up to a 1,000 to 1 turn down. Um, as far as the, the, the orifice plate and the, the, differential, uh, the, the differential pressure, um, Great technology, very, very well known across the industry, very common in liquids, also very common in gases. Um, what you do see is a, a sharp edged orifice plate that, that is installed into the process media and you're trying to generate a, a measurable pressure difference on one side of the orifice plate versus on the other side of the or orifice plate. And the, the square root extraction of that pressure drop um, it's proportional to not your mass flow, but your, your volumetric flow rate. And, you know, measuring liquids is one thing, measuring gases that are compressible, um, 
you typically will want to have a, a mass flow measurement. So what, what you see there is you have two things where I'd, I'd say thermal might be a little bit better positioned. Um, for one, you need a, a pressure instrument and you need a temperature instrument to account for any density changes in the media. Uh, send those to the, the DCS. Sometimes you use a flow computer and you have your mass flow measurement. So the first difference, number one, a direct mass flow measurement with one instrument versus needing temperature and pressure uh, to, to accommodate the, the density changes. All right, just so I understand. So you have a plate with an orifice, right? And Correct. I would imagine that creates a pressure drop from there. So how might this factor in when considering which instrument to use? That, that's a great point. That that was going to be my, my second point. The the orifice plate is is used to create a, a, a measurable pressure drop. Um, and, it, and it does cause an, an energy loss. Now, you know, lost media, the pressure drop, it might not be critical in, in every application, but for some of these these more expensive gases and some of these more uh, expensive medias that, that that pressure drop your your dollars your pesos your euros um, there is a cost to that, that that could add up over time now the the example that, that we like to give is let's say you have uh, a four inch line with uh, with 3000 scfm uh, with with an orifice plate, you'd be looking at something somewhere in the ballpark of a of a 50 inches of water column loss. Um, you you take the orifice plate out and and you install thermal mass. Typically, what you see is a is a pressure drop that is anywhere between five and ten times less severe. So the the same four inch line, the same 3000 scfm, you'd be looking at something a little bit more in the ballpark of of. 15 inches of water column on your, your pressure drop. So there is a, a measurable difference in that, that pressure drop and that energy loss. And depending on what you're running, the, the cost of that, uh, it, it, it can add up over the, the life of the instrument. So we, we've talked a lot about energy loss and I don't want to bring anybody else down further because energy loss is a problem for a lot of different industries, a lot of different uh, applications there. So I'm going to try to to energize this a little bit and flare it back up if we can. Flare it up. <laughs> yeah, flare it up if we can here on the show. Uh, if if you think about the process industries, and again, we covered those at the beginning, you know, chemical plants, oil and gas operations, things like that, even, even wastewater treatment facilities. Um, flares are everywhere. So what insights might you have on measurements in, say, flaring applications? You're, you're correct. Lots of lots of flare everywhere here. Flares um, everywhere on this show. Flares Let's everywhere. Let's talk about it. There, there's two things that, that, that come to mind. Uh, one is the the unique challenge that operators have to to measure in both the the super low flow conditions, so your your normal operating conditions, versus the the the, the much higher flows that you would see under blowdown conditions or under under upset conditions. So that's number one. Okay. Number two, uh, depending on where you are in the world, there are environmental standards. There's there's regulations that you have to meet, and and those those boil down to you need an accurate measurement across mm -hmm. that that flow range. Um, as far as is thermal and and right fit applications, the the thermal mass flow measurement in general, we believe, is very well suited to to, to flaring applications. Because of that that turn down that, that we talked about, so you you have a a one hundred to one all the way up to a, a one thousand to one turn down ratio uh, in with special calibration techniques that some manufacturers offer um, that gives you that that accuracy across the board. Now, one advantage, kind of going back to um, you have one instrument, one measurement that carries over especially well to flares. Um, because other technologies, depending on what you have, uh, those do tend to have a lower turndown range. So an alternative would be to uh, to stack instruments to get mm -hmm. a different technology in there. Maybe it's very accurate across a, a 10 to one or even a you know a 30, 50 to one turndown range. But you'd need to install multiple instruments to get that that accuracy requirement uh, that you need across the range. Whereas with thermal, 100 to one, thousand to one, works well under the, the normal uh, low flow standard operating conditions and you're, you're covered under the, the blow down or the, the upset conditions as well. So you said a thousand to one. Did I get that right? Thousand to one. All right. Thousand to one turned it. That, that seems like a really bold claim. 
So I know you mentioned special. I'm doing air quotes for those of you that are listening on Spotify and Apple iTunes uh, and not watching on the site, but uh, you mentioned special calibration techniques. techniques. So how does that actually work? We have our, our, our flare focused ST100A thermal mass flow meter. And on, on the, the ST100A, uh, we, we have multiple four to 20 outputs that are going to, to a DCS. Uh, what we do is we have one calibration point on there that is strategically placed to give you the, the highest accuracy, the highest precision under those low flow conditions. And we have another calibration point on there that we, we use the, the second four to 20 with right. um, to give you the, 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 the highest accuracy and the highest precision under the, the high flow point. So um, you would have the, the, the calibration uh, optimized across those two four to 20s, each one sending a signal to, to the DCS. If you're, you're using a, a bus communication, you would have a, a single digital signal going to the DCS, but it, it's it's taking advantage of the strategic calibration points and using those multiple outputs to give you that 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 absolute high level of accuracy across the range. So that's interesting. I know we talked we've covered a lot of ground here talking about flow measurement specifically, right? So I, I kind of want to switch it up. I'm going to throw you a curveball here and throw you a new set of pitches here that I'm going to switch the conversation. I'm switch it up. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to switch it up uh, to pumps. So we all know that they can be expensive to fix, no matter what uh, area or industry you're in, right? So downtime costs money, and it's a multi-million dollar problem across a multitude of industries. So what have your team seen with pumps and best practices over the years? Can you give us some examples of that? I think the the, the pumps are expensive. The, the downtime of a pump, man, those, those could be some really bad, really expensive scenarios. That, that's what you, you want to avoid. Um, going into facilities, our team hears a lot of what, what we feel is misplaced blame on the pump manufacturer when, when in our world, um, we're, we're more of the opinion that the, the equipment that you choose and, and select to surround the pump, to, to support the installation of the pump, to ensure a mm-hmm. good float of the pump, that those, those play a major factor and you can't always blame the, the pump manufacturer. Right. Exactly. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 two issues that, that we see, um, you know, over overheating and, and dry run to the, to the pump you know, cause your, your bearings to burn up and, and, and not a good situation on that. Never. Right. And, and also, uh, cavitation is a, is a very common issue. And what, what we see and what we, what we tend to, to recommend for, for each of those is, is number one, um, you know, switching up the conversation. I'll, I'll pull this thing out again. This is actually a flow switch and, and not, not a flow meter. Right. Um, for those of you, real quick, for those of you listening uh, on Apple iTunes or uh, Spotify, Adam is holding up a product now, a solution that he's going to go through. But you can always see it uh, if you visit the the site and watch the show on the site. But go ahead, Adam. I just want to let our listeners kind of yeah. know. So one of the key things, so so thermal mass flow meters, mm-hmm. flow measurement, the flow meter, we're, we're measuring gas. We're, we're not flow meter. We're not measuring liquids with the flow switch the the thermal property the switch um low flow on liquids wet or dry on liquids um that's within our range because we're not we're not measuring flow per se where you need a continuous readout but it does hey we're, we're wet or dry you have a certain interface sound the alarm uh yeah. we're, we're 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 in the danger zone as far as our our, our minimum flow that we need going to this pump we're close to the danger zone of the, right. the, the minimal flow that we need going into the, the, the suction of this pump. So you don't, right. you don't burn up your bearings. Um, to us, it's a simple solution. Uh, switch manufacturers, the, the, the thermal breed in particular, um, you've got two relays on here. You, you set one relay uh, to the, the almost devastating condition to sound an alarm and yep. to alert your operators. Something's up. We have a, a pending situation. Go <laughs> check it out. Code red. Um, when you when you when you reach the the dry run state, sound another alarm, and people aren't just running to the pump to 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 save it, but it, it it'll shut down the equipment before before too much damage is done. So, um, low flow, no flow alarms to to keep you from from dry running the pump. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I, I think it's a very economical uh, measure to, to take when you're, you're thinking about what type of equipment should we surround the, the pump with. Um, the other one, uh, cavitation, right? So you, you've got the, 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 the bubbles in there. And as they, they go to the, the higher pressure parts of the pump, they, they collide violently and, and they can cause some, some pretty serious internal damage to the pump. Um, certainly decrease the the performance of the pump. And what you see if you read some of the, the pump installation manuals is, well, you want a good, consistent flow of, mm-hmm. you know, going to the, the, the suction part of that pump. You don't want irregularities. You don't want obstructions in the flow. You want a good, solid fl- flow profile going in there. And that, that will help you reduce the likelihood and potential damage that gets done with cavitation. Um, one of the manuals that we read recently said you need 10 diameters uh, of pipe length upstream. You go to the facility, you see elbows everywhere. You know, you, right, you're not going to get the, the mm-hmm. 10 diameters. Uh, that's <laughs> that's some pretty valuable real estate. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the question that we encourage operators and, and engineers to ask is, what are the flow conditioning options that are available? You know, do, you, do you install a flow conditioning plate? Do you install... Uh, some manufacturers, FCI included, uh, they they have options where you have that. an elbow uh, yeah. with with integral flow conditioning into it. So, um, cavitation bad, uh, ten diameters upstream, not always the case. You you don't always have that real estate. Look into flow conditioning because that will will help you uh, measurably reduce the likelihood of of cavitation and the the damage that it it might cause. I mean, it goes without saying, I mean, cavitation is bad. Before coming into this conversation, I had a somewhat of a general idea as to what that actually was. Yeah. But I mean, uh, you really shed a lot of light into defining it and why it's a problem and why it needs to be fixed. My dentist thinks it's bad too. Right. He hates it, right? Cavitation. <laughs> he hates it. I mean, they're, uh, they're, they're on the front lines of the cavitation uh, battle. I'm sure. So, um, <laughs> all right. So one final question before I let you go. So it seems that hydrogen and green hydrogen have been all the rage lately. You know, if we're talking, if we're talking about it in this, in this instance here and in this ecosystem. So what have you seen thus far as challenges in green energy production and electrolysis and, uh, and any guidelines you can, you can add to it. So what are you seeing and what guidelines can you, can you add to it? A commentary, uh, you're the expert. So, uh, what can you tell us? Well, the, 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 the real expert, the real experts out there, uh, are, our our, our, our distributors and our, our manufacturers reps. Uh, we, we cover the globe, 75 of them, uh, around the world. And first thing I'll say is we, and they combined are, are seeing it. We're, we're seeing the, the green energy, the, the hydrogen really take off. A, a statistic that I would share, one of the major green energy players said that it right now it's a it's a, a six point five billion dollar market that is expected to grow at a thirty one percent CAGR between now and in twenty thirty two. It's a lot and, of money. And we're we're seeing it. We're seeing right. quite a few uh you know they're 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 building the the electrolyzers and the surrounding the surrounding auxiliary equipment. Uh we're seeing the the big installations and um, we are we are getting the calls uh, to 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 measure the hydrogen to to measure you know do we have the the right the right flow of water uh, mm-hmm. is it too high is it too low going back to that that that, that switch conversation um, one thing that 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 we've we've seen um, so this green hydrogen and electrolyzers in the grand scheme of the the process industries um, it's a newer phenomenon mm-hmm. but measuring and calibrating to to hydrogen applications is not new um we've been doing it for 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 six decades in our our calibration lab doing actual gas calibrations um a couple of things that that we've seen that have have been true here is is number one uh hydrogen has very very difficult thermal properties you know the, the cooling effect is immense it's not like you're measuring air. It's not like you're you're measuring natural gas. Not to to say that, that those don't have their their own challenges, um, but the, the thermal properties make it very hard to measure. And and one thing that that we've seen the requirements for that we've suggested is uh, an ISO standard called ISO fourteen five eleven that mm-hmm. says that your your most accurate, your most precise, your most reliable calibration 
is done in the actual gas media that the instrument is going to be used in. Um, that's that's what we do. That's what we recommend religiously and consistently uh, in the the hydrogen measurement applications. And and and, and again, it's it's the, the cooling effect of the media. Um, what you see with with manufacturers who might say, okay, well, we're going to calibrate an air, and then we'll we'll plug in an equation, we'll do a correction factor, and this air calibration across, across the flow range with these correction factors. Um, Here's what it means for hydrogen. Well, that 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 cooling effect and those unique thermal properties of hydrogen make that an impractical thing, an, an impractical thing. So our, our recommendation: calibrating the actual gas ISO fourteen five eleven. Um, that that should be one of the first things that, that you do. Um, the other thing that you see is is hydrogen is is not not necessarily the the, the safest gas. You know, I, I think of the Hindenburg. Right, uh, right exactly. People, I was just going to say that. Talk about the Hindenburg. People remember the Hindenburg. But uh, the, the ignition range uh, of four to seventy four percent, very very flammable in the the presence of air. Um, the complexity of the the systems that you have, the the real estate that they're 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 working with, um, safety becomes a requirement, or safety yeah. should be front and center of of the conversation as far as how do we build these things, what what type of equipment do we want to use, um, the the instruments, what type of a of a safety integrity level, what type of sill rating should they have, and. Um, just a, a little bit of a crash course on SIL and SIL-1 versus SIL-2 versus no SIL. If you have a, a SIL-1 rated instrument, your, your risk reduction factor is, is anywhere from 10 to 100 times uh, risk reduction from no SIL rating. You, mm -hmm. you, you, you install a, a SIL-2 instrument or a SIL-2 system, that, that risk reduction uh, improves to 100 to 1,000. So the question that, that I would encourage all to ask is, um, safety is crucial here. What what type of SIL standard uh, are your, your instruments rated to? Mm -hmm. The SIL 2, we, we talked about the, the measurable uh, improvements that you make there. And yep. these are the applications where calibrate in hydrogen um, use your, 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 your best judgment as far as the SIL rating. Uh, SIL 2 is better than SIL 1. SIL 1 is better than no SIL rating. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. H2O, uh, you're taking the, the hydrogen from the oxygen and water. So find a good way to measure hydrogen. Um, find a good way to measure the oxygen. You, you need a certain flow rate uh, as far as what what will work and what won't work on the, the inlet to some of those systems for the water. And there's also surrounding applications as far as, well, we, we have air running here uh, for, for ventilation. Um, safety is at the front and center and hydrogen use your, your actual gas calibration. Uh, good information to have. Always important to talk about not just efficiency, but safety. So I'm glad that we touched on that. Uh, Adam Schlehan with FCI. Thank you very much for joining us. One last question for you. How can somebody reach out and get in contact with you or FCI or any of your distributors so they can they can partake and uh, benefit from some of the expertise that, that you've given today and, and beyond that? Great, great question. Um, as I said, our our reps and our distributors, uh, they are they are experts in what they do. They 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 carry and understand very well thermal mass flow technologies. They also have nice line cards as far as as other other technologies and other types of instruments that would, would best suit your, your measurement needs. So there's a good level of understanding. There's a good level of objectivity. Um, get in touch with, with one of our, our sales channel partners. Um, our website, fluidcomponents.com, uh, is an excellent place to, to engage with us. Uh, we, we have an online store. Uh, if you're, you're hey looking now. to buy right. instruments online, yep. you know, our, our, our sales office locator it would be the best way to, to get in touch with uh with one of our our field experts that works at one of our uh domestically rep firms internationally uh our, our distribution network excellent adam thank you very much cannot wait to have you back on the show we appreciate you being here and uh for all of you listening and watching around the world we appreciate you spending here some time here with us and we will see you next time on the water online show